It's a romantic comedy. Uh, very happy to bring on out here writer-director Ryan Gosling. You doing? Thank you very much. How many of you were at the uh, screening last night, just curiously? A few people. Cool. cool. No one. All right. <laughs> Great. You know, this, uh, seeing this like alternate, uh, very not safe for work trailer, uh, it's, it's darker, I like that. It doesn't really give too much away. And, you know, I, I like, like for those who haven't yet seen the movie, if you can talk about what this dark fairy tale is, is all about. Um, <clears throat> well, it's sort of, so I had an opportunity to work in Detroit and I'm from Canada, so. Let's just get that out of the way right now. And I, I guess growing up in Canada, you know, Detroit was far enough away that I never got there, but it was close enough that I, I, I had like a, I guess like a crush on it or something. I it just seemed like everything cool came from Detroit, you know, uh, like Eminem and uh, <laughs> the Model T and, you know, Motor City, the, just the whole like iconic idea of the American dream. And, when I got there, which was a few years ago, it's very different now. There's a, they were declaring bankruptcy. It's like 40 miles of abandoned buildings, a lot of you know houses burning, being torn down, turning off the power to the streetlights, and within within these empty neighborhoods, occasionally there's a family trying to hold on to their home, and it seemed that you know like the the dream had turned into a nightmare for these people. So. I thought I'd like to try and make a film about that. Um, and, then, and then I thought this sort of fairy tale approach might be the best way to just make it more accessible to everyone because it feels like uh, you know, it's, there's lost rivers everywhere, not just in Detroit, and that's sort of what's happening to them is, is, um, is something that, that uh, is specific to there, but also something that I wanted sort of everybody to be able to relate to. So we, we sort of gave it this fairy tale tone and that's how the movie sort of began. You uh, talked last night to that you basically just started roaming with the red camera and, and basically started making a movie before you even knew you were going to be making a movie. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the creative itches that directing scratched for you that uh, you don't ordinarily get working in film as an actor. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's sort of how it started that like well, there were, it started with there were these Brewster projects, which are the projects where, um, uh, the, they call them the Motown projects, where uh, the Supremes grew up. And they just have a great music history, and they're about to be torn down. And I thought, oh, I, and they're just, I thought I wanted to film them. So I got a red camera, I started shooting them, and then there was, um, there's more like I heard about the, pa like the Palace Theater, which is where the Stooges first played, and that that was going to be torn down. And I just, so, I started filming and then after a year I realized oh, I guess I'm shooting footage for a movie and uh, you know I guess I'm making a movie this is lonely I should get some people here <laughs> and uh, so I sort of wrote the script and then I got the actors and then eventually we were we were shooting uh, you know not on the red anymore on film and it was like an actual film but um, I guess some of the itches that it scratched were um, I guess it was like an opportunity to to try some things out, you know, that you don't always get to try on uh, on every film. Like, for instance, you know, there's something very like surreal about what's happening there, but at the same time, it's also very real. And I wanted to try and make a film that like incorporated both of those elements. So part of what we tried to do was give it a heightened reality and a fairy tale tone, but also incorporate people from the neighborhoods uh, to give it that sort of um, like to bring the reality into the into the fantasy, and uh, that was sort of the most fun. It was like sort of working with the non actors and the actors and trying to balance those uh, those tones. How much? Uh, I mean, some of my favorite sequences are, are the ones that have have locals just kind of roaming in there, and you, you really feel it. It has it has a different different kind of energy right. uh, when there's when there's non professionals uh, mi mixing with actors. Um, how how much of it was made? Uh, in the moment, how much did you rely on uh, just the the exploration of, of happy accidents and just kind of playing in this environment? I feel like it was kind of a, a like a healthy balance of both. You know, um, we always tried to be open to what was going on. You know, for instance, if there was something ha like one of my favorite scenes in the movie is a scene with Matt Smith 
and this lady at a gas station and what it was sort of like you know this gas station was the only gas station for for like 10 blocks where we were shooting and I think they were selling something else at the gas station you know that like like people really wanted you know and uh, and they didn't care that we were making a movie they just you know like had to get it and so there was a real tension you know because we were trying to shoot this film and people were really sort of uh, upset that we were there and at a certain point we thought oh just like let them in the scene you know and and so what happened was they started sort of interacting with the actors and the actors were so Matt I think did the this amazing job of pulling this one woman whose name is Mama A into the scene and they started dancing together and it had this really you know it 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 was it was literally like the 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 fantasy and the reality were sort of dancing with one another you know so it felt like the kind of highlight of what we were we were we were trying to do mm -hmm. Uh, did anybody participate in the, the Twitter conversation with Ryan earlier today? Or were we looking at Twitter? Uh, this is from Sandra Swan Queen. At Sandra Swan, Swan Queen asked, what scene was the most difficult? Okay, well, it was, the mo it was scenes, and they were the most difficult, but they also ended up being sort of, again, some of my favorite scenes, which was that the kid that we hired in our movie, this kid Landon, who plays the little boy in the film, turns out he doesn't like the camera. And he would get very upset and run away from it when he saw it, which makes it, you know, difficult when you're trying to film the scene. <laughs> but I, I loved him. He's such a special kid. And we thought, like, how do we... So I remember seeing uh, on the making of the Animal Planet how when they, like, guys would wait for months just to get a shot of the bird coming out of the nest. And I thought, that's a long time to wait for a bird to come out of a nest, you know? But when you see that shot, you're like, God damn, that's a beautiful shot of that that bird coming out of the nest. So we adopted those tactics in a way. We sort of like put on long lenses and hid in the bushes. And uh, at one point we hid under some laundry in, the, in his room. And you know, so, it, so we didn't make him nervous. You know, he was able to be natural. And, and we ended up getting some of the most, you know, some of my favorite stuff in the film. He's just, it was kind of like what I heard it was like to work with Marlon Brando on Apocalypse Now, you know? <laughs> that he would just come in and do what he was going to do and then leave. So we called Landon Marlin. But, uh, so that was difficult, but in the end it was like we took it as an opportunity and, uh, and, and in the end it was like, I, I feel like I'm so glad that, that we did it. He was, he's amazing in the film. It's good to know, too, that you can use Animal Planet for, like, parenting tips down the road, too, <laughs> right. if need be. Uh, well, speaking of uh, scenes, I think we're going to watch a clip from Lost River. Very good. Oh man, Ben Mendelsohn is so, such a deviant in this film. He's so, uh, so much fun to watch. I mean, they're all really fun to watch. Uh, you know, we, we talked last night about, about how exciting it is when, a, when an actor becomes a filmmaker because you know that they're going to already know what that experience is like on the other side of the camera. But I was wondering if we could talk maybe more practically about things that you've gleaned from other movie sets and how you were able to approach your actors to be able to get what you needed. Well, I think, you know, one thing that I got from other movie sets was like this experience of working with some of these actors. Like, for instance, I got to work with Mendelssohn on a film called A Place Beyond the Pines. And, you know, he would come to set with a boombox playing Run DMC and singing it like he was Al Jolson. And it was like, you know, and then he put it down and do the scene. But there was this whole other side of him, this kind of like song and dance man, you know. And so I thought... I, I kind of dog-eared it when we were working together, and I thought, like, if I ever make a film, I want to, I'd love to, you know, like, write something for him where he could be a terrifying song and dance band, you know. Or, for instance, I, I almost worked with Saoirse Ronan on a film, or, you know, I got a chance to, like, rehearse with her, or I worked with Christina Hendricks, so, you know, or, like, a lot of my crew came, came from other film sets, like, uh, you know, my first AD, my production designer, um, my uh, costume designer. We all did a film called Half Nelson together, and so and we've since made like five or six movies, you know. So it was. They were all people, you know. I kind of felt like a, a um, George Clooney in Ocean's Eleven, where I got to pick, you know, like my my special team, and everyone was like a special a specialist in their field. But 
you know, they also were all friends. I trusted them. You know, it was a very small movie set, very like familial, like family homemade thing. So, and in my experience, that's kind of where you you get the best results in a, in the final product, anyways, if you sort of make things that way. Well, within that dream team, uh, I was wondering if you could talk some about the about the aesthetics of it. I mean, this is a very visually arresting film. It's very dark. Obviously, there's some there's some really macabre imagery in it as well. Uh, you know, from script to screen. How did you approach all of that? Well, I guess I kind of wanted to, uh, you know, uh, well, like when I first sent the script to my composer, he, uh, he, a few hours later, he texted me and he said, Dark Goonies, cool. <laughs> and I was like, okay, good, he, he gets it, you know. And I think that, like, Goonies and uh, those early Amblin movies, just like the whole 80s sensibility of films that I grew up on, like, you won't see Howard the Duck as a direct reference in the movie, but I mean, there was something very experimental. Do you like Howard the Duck? It's I mean, it's haunting. Awesome. Um, you know, like, or batteries not included, or gremlins, or whatever. There was something happening then when I first started watching movies. You know, there's something very kind of, like, experimental in all of that. And, and so I wanted, them to, I wanted the film to have that sensibility. Uh, and Secret of Nim was a big influence, and so my storyboard artist was actually one of the animators on Secret of Nim. And um, I also was a big fan of Benoit Deby. Uh, he's one of my favorite cinematographers. You know, we shot on film, we shot all natural light, um, we shot with really fast lenses. So, like for instance, if a scene was lit by a TV, it was just really lit by the television, and because we wanted the film to be dark. And we wanted to find a way to sort of capture what was naturally beautiful about the environment, but also, you know, not try and affect it too much. I think we have another question here from the Twitter conversation earlier. This is from at Ryan Gosling Love, L-U-V. <laughs> I had to use L-U-V because L-O-V-E was already taken. This is me. Hello, Ryan. That's my, my Twitter account, actually, <laughs> so just sorry Hello, about that. Hello, Ryan. My question is simple. Why the name Belladonna? It's the name of a toxic plant. Thanks. Well, simple. It's because it's the name of a toxic plant. And uh, Barbara Steele, who plays Belladonna in the film, the great Barbara Steele, she named herself, so I wasn't going to argue with her. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, the, uh, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're going into battle, as, as Samuel Fuller uh, you know, would say about filmmaking, there's just no way to know, uh, you know, what's going to happen, what obstacles, speed bumps are going to, to come up. Uh, was there anything that ever felt disastrous or near disastrous that uh, you were able to overcome? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, you know, we had a really charmed experience in Detroit. You know, obviously the neighbors we, neighborhoods we were in were not, you know, conducive for shooting and a lot of things could have gone sideways, but they didn't, you know. But I think, I think more than anything, I mean, and it, look, and, and, and this is a, um, one aspect of Detroit that we're showing, you know, but the, the, the amazing thing about Detroit is that it's also going through this rebirth and this reinvention and there's an incredible energy there and there's like great talent and, and so many, you know, like amazing other locations. And I feel like, I don't know, at the same time as we were sort of like taking risks by shooting in the places we were, we were also really supported by by the film community out there, so so it felt like, you know, th you know, things could have gone sideways, but they didn't because we had a great like team around us. It's very it's very common uh, for for people to want to compare something to to something else. You know, this film looks like it's got this style or or whatnot. But I was wondering if you could talk about some of your creative influences outside of film, if any. Um, well. I mean, again, I feel like the, uh, uh, you know, the people that really influence your movie at the end of the day it, are the, the people you're working with, you know? So, like, music was a big influence on this film, you know? When I was going around Detroit and, and shooting on my own for, over the course of that year, I was listening to a lot of Johnny Jewell's music. And so, you know, that, that affected how I was shooting and just the tone of, you know, of, of what I was doing, and it became sort of cooked into the image from the beginning, you know. Um, I think, you know, working, like Benoit's work is really inspiring to me, so to get to make this movie with him was like a big, a big thrill, but, um, so I don't know, those, those were, those, those were influences, you know. 
uh, when working with, with an ensemble, uh, you obviously you already told the story about working with a, with a child actor who didn't like the camera, uh, but did you have to use uh, any different styles to be able to talk to different actors, even if you had worked with them previously? Like different styles of directing? Sure. Not really, because the truth is that I hired everyone because I, I admire them and I trust them, and so for me it wasn't like directing them as much as it was letting them you know, fill in the characters and sort of tell me what they would and wouldn't do. I mean, I was there if they wanted to talk about something, but I'm, I'm more I feel like my job was to sort of create an environment and a space for them to sort of do their thing, you know. It's like, for instance, and I feel like that really, that worked for us, you know, like, like Mendelssohn. You know, there's an amazing scene at the end where he has this crazy, terrifying dance attack. And I didn't know what he was going to do, but I just sort of knew that with the space he would do something and so he said look just set up the camera and 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 and, and I'm gonna do my thing and he came in and he put down his iPad and he put Kendrick Lamar's bad bitches <laughs> and he started to uh, do this terrifying dance routine that was like nothing I could have written you know <laughs> and so in that case it's like you're, you're glad you're not like trying to over direct uh Last night I had asked you like what you had learned from this going forward because you said you would like to make more films. Uh, but more important, what did you learn not to do? Did you have any uh, rookie mistakes that you know you won't you won't do again? I mean, there's tons of them. You know, I don't want to highlight them. <laughs> uh, they're obvious. You know, it's you don't know how to make a film until you make a film. Yeah. And so that's the that's the the hard part of your first film is that you're sort of you're learning as you go. But. You, you immediately, once you finish, just can't wait to get back in there and start sort of applying all the, all the things that you learned. Come on, you can, you can mention something that was, that was maybe hard. I mean, you, you did it, you made, you made a finished film. I yeah. mean, that's, that's more than most can say. I mean, uh, was, was there anything that, like you can say, okay, I overcame that, but you may not have known going into it? Um, can you give me an example? I don't know, just something that, um, when you're not sitting in the director's chair, when you only see right. it from you know, the other side of the camera, you may not know that a director has to do X, Y, and Z. Were, were there any of those things that- Well, I was surprised that there's so much acting involved in directing, you know? I mean, I was glad to have been an actor before because you know, you're constantly acting like there's not a problem, but there's always a problem, you know? <laughs> Everything's always going wrong and you're always acting like it's fine and it's a part of the plan, so. I think an acting background is good in that. That was surprising. Uh, for those who haven't seen the film, I, one of my favorite set pieces uh, is, this, is this club, this very, very morbid club. That's where you see Christina Hendricks uh, tearing off her skin. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, especially for those who haven't seen the movie and see what they're getting themselves into. Um, that's a club that's sort of based on the Grand Guignon, which is a... Um, was really like the birth of, of horror and splatter cinema. You know, it was theater, but it was a place in the 20s in Paris where they would put on these murder shows, these hyper-realistic sort of torture and murder shows. And, and there was a whole scene at that time, like the Hell Cafe and the, and the Death Tavern and this really macabre, dark murder entertainment scene. And so we use that a lot, a lot of that as inspiration. The, the facade of the club that's on the posters is, is like, is, is, is like based on the, the front of the Hell Cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, writing, uh, you, you know, you already started shooting, so you, you kind of had a, a, a feel for, you know, you had your, like, your, your, your lookbook uh, in, in real time, uh, but sitting down to actually write a script, was, how, how was that for you? Did it come naturally? Did you bang your head against the wall somewhere in between? Yeah, it's lonely, you know, and, uh, you know, but the thing that you're hoping is that, you know, I guess I had been there over the course of the year and I knew set pieces that I wanted to use. Like, for instance, uh, like I shot one, the opening shot of the movie is this kind of a pan down from the ceiling to reveal this, this like dilapidated theater. And that's the Palace Theater, I think, where, where uh, I think it's called the Palace, but that, that was the theater where, um, you know, the Stooges first played. And I knew that I wanted to someday go back and finish that shot where, where the lead character would appear out of the hole in the stage, you know? And, uh, which is another thing I learned from being there, that like a way that some people make money is they go around these empty buildings and they take all the copper and they strip these buildings of their, 
of the metal and sell it. So I knew I wanted my lead character to do that, and I knew that I wanted him to come out of that stage, and that's how I wanted to meet him. So, so then, uh, and we did. A year later, we shot the. F There's a year between those two shots in the movie, you know. But uh, so those sort of things inform the writing process. You know, it was good. I thought to to be there and to uh, be in the environments and, and be able to write for specific locations. Spec also because I knew that some of them were going to be torn down. So we wanted to hustle and we wanted to shoot in them before they were gone. What were you looking for in, in the location scouting? I mean, this is a very different side of Detroit than I'm, I'm used to seeing in movies. I mean, I, I feel like the, uh, you know, the post-industrial squalor is, is certainly has a poetry to it, but there's still all this, uh, the, 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 the green, the overrun greenery and, and whatnot. I mean, what were, what were some of the things that, you, that really uh, attracted you to, to want to put them on film? Well, I think it was like we wanted to find places that had a that had history, you know, even if we weren't going to sort of reveal that history in the movie, but that like you could feel that maybe, you know. For instance, like the movie also kind of starts with a guy named Skip who um who's really like a a real version of what this movie's about, which is that he grew up on this street. He's now in his 50s, I think, and he's the only one left for 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 blocks, you know. And he sort of wanders around in the street in a kind of a daze. You know, he feels like he, it's, for him, he, he feels like it's, you know, uh, he's in some kind of Twilight Zone episode or something, you know. Being a kid was just yesterday, and he can, he can tell you about, you know, everything, that, the way things used to be, you know, and who used to live there and what used to happen here. And when he's doing it, it almost becomes real. And there's like a, a weird a daze that he gets, that they get into when they talk about, their, you know, their neighborhoods, and we wanted to try and capture that feeling, you know. So, so we were looking for locations like that, for people like that, for people that could kind of, um, um, you know, uh, you know, also remembered the way that they were, you know. So it wasn't just specifically like the, um, the buildings. It was also just like finding connections to those buildings. Do, uh, was there anything that you shot that you uh, were sad to see? not make it into the final film, like any, anything that just did, didn't work in the cohesive whole? Misty and Holly. There was these two girls that were walking by when we were shooting, and they were talking about their cat, Sagwa. And he had just had babies. She had just had babies. And they were incredible, and I, and I asked them to be in the movie, and they did this amazing scene where they talked about Sagwa. And then we met our lead character. It was another op way to, to meet him. And... Uh, for the 15 cuts, we tried to have them in the film, but at the end of the day, it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't, we had to focus on the story, you know? But there were so many great people that we met that we tried to incorporate, you know, that, that were just, you know, just, we couldn't, just didn't make the final cut, but that hurt. You mentioned that this is, that, that you, you got, you got the band together, all your friends were working on this, people you've collaborated with. Uh, can you maybe talk about some of the, some of the, the unsung heroes we haven't talked about? Uh, I really like the music, for instance, in, oh, in the yeah. film. Thanks. Yeah, Johnny Jewell. Um, you know, I had, um, I had a kind of Kaiser Sose moment with him. I felt like Chaz Palminteri, and I realized that he was behind all these bands that I loved and, uh, you know, kind of uncredited. And, uh, yeah, we worked together, you know, I was, again, like, listening to a lot of his music while I was shooting, and, uh, um, you know, he's, he's, I think he does a beautiful job, you know, it has, like, that 80s sensibility, but it's, like, still, I think, his own, his own sound. Um, there was Do you a, listen to music when you're on set? Um, we did on this, on this film, you know, I, uh, we, we listened to, I, I would play the actors, Johnny's music, just to you know, try and get them into the... Also, it's like hard to be listening to the crew talk, you know, when you're trying to get ready for a scene. So we played some of his music. Uh, and what about anybody else in the, uh, the cast and crew? You, you feel like really brought something that uh, maybe doesn't get mentioned in these kinds of conversations? Well, like my friend Spaff, who, drew, who, who was one of the animators on Secret of Nim, you know, he did all this kind of like, uh, you know, he helped me sort of conceptualize it in the beginning and then... You know, he used to work for Disney as well. He drew like part of the Under the Sea sequence in Little Mermaid. He drew uh, um, the opening title credits of Break In. You know, kind of everything that like had some impact on me with a kid. It, he was involved in. So now, he did lots of things on the film. Like he built our set. You know, uh, in the in the club that you were mentioning. He, you know, we didn't have a lot of money on the movie, so you know we had to be like creative. And he he made an entire set out of cardboard in two hours and. You'll ne you would never know that. It was so, so beautiful. Or, um, 
you know, everybody chipped in on this film, which was nice. You know, we all kind of did each other's jobs, and uh, um, so yeah, the whole everybody is in there. It's sometimes hard to to talk about a, a film when people haven't necessarily seen it yet. I don't want to give away the the pleasures that are in the movie. Uh, but you mentioned you mentioned that uh, that like family movies, Amblin movies were were you know, a huge inspiration for this kind of thing, but certainly this is much darker than, uh, than I remember those movies being. Uh, I'm curious what just attracts you to a darker sensibility, which I think is a through line in some of the, some of the roles that you choose as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> well, you know, I guess we were just trying to, you know, because this movie wasn't an idea first and then sort of looking for a place to shoot it and, you know, it wasn't like I felt like, oh, I'm going to direct now. It came from being there. It came from wanting to make something there. Um, it's, it's, it's dark days for the people in those neighborhoods, you know, and like we could have made a documentary or we could have made a realistic film, but in a way, you know, we wanted to try and uh, tap into the and focus on just like the emotional landscape of those characters, you know? And, um, and so we felt like we had to, you know, it's, it's, it's threatening to be there for people that are there on their own, you know? And um, we wanted to kind of like honor that in a way, you know? So it just felt like it had to be dark. It had to be sort of like, there had to be an impending threat um, in order to sort of, um, you know, do, do justice to it. I think uh, at this point we are going to turn it over. Uh, I don't get to pick the people. I think I think some people have already been. Hey, um, I actually worked on the movie with you. I was an intern. Hi. Do you remember me? No? How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, so one of my tasks was always to pack the boxes of film at the end of the day. Yeah. And um, I think it's really cool. I mean, I still shoot 35, like still photography, and I just wanted to know like. How, um, how you got funding, first of all, for 35, because it's like really expensive, and then uh, why you chose to do 35. Thanks for your work again. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Um, sorry, we have to meet like this. Um, so the 35 was, uh, you know, it's something I, I mean, I grew up watching films, so like my dream was to make a, a film on film. It's a, it seemed like, you know, it's, no one, it's hard to do now, so you know, I kind of, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it. And also I was shooting on my red and getting beautiful stuff, so I just felt like maybe I'm just being romantic about film. And, but then, you know, my, my DP, Benoit, is just, he's like filmed to the grave. And he was so, such an advocate for it that I felt like I had an ally there. And once I had that partner, we were willing to, we were able to kind of fight for it, you know. And there, there was some digital stuff in there, right? Yeah, it's a mix of of, of the red and. Um, I was and, I re watching the GoPro. film last night. I was looking for it, knowing that, and I, it was seamless to me. You can't really tell. I mean, I mean, you can tell, and I think. Well, anyway, I don't want to bore you. It's like difference between film and digital, but, um, you know, I'm glad we did it. You know, on film, I felt like also, um, film's kind of a dying thing, and we were, you know, we were. We were trying to. Uh, I don't think it is dying, you know, but it feels like it's it's on it's it's on life support, you know, and it felt like the right thing to shoot this this movie on, given the subject matter. Um, but I, I I loved it, and I thought I thought it had like um, I, I'm really glad that we fought for it, you know. But it, and in terms of like getting money for it, it all kind of worked out to be the same, you know. Like the, there's it's they say it's more expensive, but I didn't really find that. You know, I mean, you have to be more careful about how you use it. You can't shoot it. You can't be, you know, you have to be really specific about what you shoot. But I think if you are, you can, you can kind of work, work, work it. It works out to be the same. Hey, Ryan, since the film came out, a lot of people have been noticing that a lot of the shots are inspired by, like, David Lynch, Dario Argento, and Terrence Malick. Are there any filmmakers in particular you're trying to emulate, in a sense? And what do you think is really important in a, as a means of finding your voice as a filmmaker to stand out on your own while also emulating? Um, we weren't trying to reference any other filmmakers in the movie, you know. Uh, I was drinking a lot of David Lynch coffee at the time. <laughs> that might have had a, an impact, you know. I feel like people talk in references nowadays. It's just the way that you talk about things. You know, even when you want to get a movie made, you can't get it made unless you say it's like this meets that 
or a band comes out and they go, it's like this, it's that band and this band. And you have to kind of make a few films before people let that go and they stop referencing you to other people, you know. It's, uh, it's certainly not something that we, we talked about, you know, and, and I think that would be something that's very hard to do in, in reality. It's, it's more like something that if you, if, you're, if you haven't made a movie, you, th you think that's the way it works. But when you make one, you know, the environment that you're shooting in, the people that you're working with, like those are the things that really dictate what the style becomes, you know. Like my, my DP, Benoit, you know, he, he was the biggest influence on the aesthetic of the movie, you know. But I think in terms of finding your own voice, you know, you got to make, you have to make films to find that, you know. And, uh, you know, film is a language that you learn from other filmmakers. That's how you learn to speak it, you know. And it's, and it, you know, I always grew up listening to, like, Spielberg talk about Kurosawa and how he was trying to make Kurosawa movies in the beginning and you know they all do that um, and I think that's kind of what's great about it you know that it is a, it's like a language Hi Ryan how are you Good how uh, are you doing Did you have any as a director any biases or sensibilities towards um, your actors since you have such a past as an actor by, what do you mean by biases? Like, uh, if you had certain ways of working with them or understandings of them that were different than, uh, you know, other directors in the ways you personally worked with them or understood their technique. Right. I think I know what you mean. Well, a lot of them I had worked with before, so I kind of knew how they worked. You know, I had, I, I had such a good experience with them, I wanted to work with them again. And, I knew, I felt like I knew what they were capable of. I also felt like I knew, I was able to see a side of them off camera, you know, that I hadn't seen in, in, their, in their work, you know, so I thought I'd like to find a way to, to highlight that or give them a chance to show that side of themselves. And then there were other actors that I hadn't worked with that I didn't know what the hell to do. Like for instance, Matt Smith, you know, I, I saw, one day I saw, I heard his voice on, on the TV, it was Doctor Who. And he was doing an episode where he was, he had a microphone and he was, you know, just like telling all these spaceships the way it was going to be. And he was, he was just, you know, like doing it like a boss, you know, just, 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 <laughs> just, 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 you know, literally ruling the universe from a microphone. And I thought, I know, I know as an actor, that's a hard scene because I'm pretty sure those spaceships weren't there, you know, <laughs> but but my God, you know, you would never know it from his performance. And I thought, this guy is incredible. That's so hard, he's making it look so easy, I gotta work with him. And then he got on set, you know, and he, you know, it was like, it was like as a first time director, having never fired a gun and then someone hands you an, a machine gun, you know? He just is a cruise missile and it's, he's like a, such a powerful talent that I didn't really know you know, how to direct him, so I decided, like, not really to try, you know, just to, just to let him kind of do his thing. And I think he created a really amazing, like, character. I've, ne I've never seen this character in a movie, so it really worked out in that case. I want to sneak one in here real quick, uh, kind of bridging those, those two last questions. Were there any, uh, were there any specific uh, tips that you learned from filmmakers that you worked with? that you were able to apply on set? Things that like, you know, oh, oh, I understand why such and such asked me or co collaborated with me in this way and you were able to use yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the thing is that like the filmmakers that I've had a great experience with kind of, they, they, they treated it like a collaboration, you know, not like a, like a dictatorship, you know? And I felt like that makes you want to you know, give more of yourself to their project, you know, because they, they're treating you like an equal, you know. And so I feel like that was like a good, you know, that was a good thing to sort of, that was a good, you know, way to, to handle it, you know, that every, you know, it's kind of like best idea wins, you know, and if everybody feels like their ideas are being kind of like heard and, and respected, then everyone's personally invested in your movie and you get like, you know, you, you get the best of everyone. Hi, so I had a question um, about the title sequence design. Um, so even just in that clip, it was really beautifully done. And I know it's really important in setting the tone of the movie, but I was curious as to whose idea that was and how you guys came about um, deciding on how to do that. Which part, like the, f like the fonts or just the- Yeah, well, like even just 
the, the fonts as well as just how it was like set up and like really eerily and everything oh, okay. like that. Yeah. Um, that was just something that, you know, we made an initial trailer. Uh, so there's, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how to like be, we made an initial trailer that was sort of meant to sort of give a, a broad, uh, a sense of the, the story, you know, but then it didn't necessarily capture the, the, the tone, you know, it gave you a sense of what the movie was about, but it didn't kind of, I, we felt like lay out how it felt. So we did this second one because we wanted to sort of show the other side of the movie, you know. And that was just something that, that I cut with my editor as opposed to the other piece, which was like more from a, a trailer house company, you know. Um, but I think they work, they work well together, you know. And in terms of font, like it's hard because it sort of really defines your movie, you know, and you can really kind of stress out over what this, like what every little bit means, you know. So um, at a certain point you just have to kind of let go, but we, that's, that's on uh, fonts.com and it's, <laughs> And it's called Dead Man's Curve. You're all welcome to use it if you like it. Hi. Hi. Um, first off, congrats. Awesome accomplishment. Um, I just wanted to ask if you had any advice for anyone who had kind of the same goals or aspirations to direct or filmmaker or anything. Any lessons learned that anyone here would want to take note of, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you know, just do it. And, uh, and uh, you know, don't listen to the haters, you know? You gotta just keep going and, uh, and making your movies, and now's a great time to do it because you can, you know, and I'm not plugging Apple, but you can use your iPhone and you can make a film. You know, I just saw a film called Tangerine that was made on an iPhone. It's incredible, it's yeah. It's beautiful. Um, there's, you can, the software is easy to cut. You know, with, you, you, there's no real reason not to now, you know, and there's so many ways to show your film uh, online that you can really, like, if, let's say you've got friends that want to be actors, you know, like, as opposed to them auditioning or trying to get agents and all that stuff, like, you just make movies with them, and they, you know what's great about your friends, and you just give them a chance to show that, and then if you're a filmmaker, you, you shoot that, and you, you know, you got a friend who wants to be an editor, let them cut it, and it's like what John Cassavetes did, but he did it in a lot, you know, it was so much harder when he did it, because he had to shoot on film and cut on a moviola, and use lights and now it's so much easier, you know. Um, and there's, there's also just for, for maybe it, it's interesting, maybe it's not, but there's a casting website called Cast It, which we use for our movie. Well, f just for certain characters, but you don't have to have an agent to audition on this site. And I thought, that's how I found my lead character, um, Ian, on this site. He does have an agent, but he also had put this up on Cast It and it's just a great website because if you're a filmmaker or you want to make something, you know, you can see your movie a hundred different ways. And it's, it's from just regular people filming themselves in their home or whatever. They, maybe they make a short film out of it. But you get to see your project in a hundred different incarnations. And it helps you to understand, you know, what you're making. Because these people have given you all these, all the, all these options of ways to see it. But it's also a great way to bypass the system and having to get an agent and, and get auditions and, and all of that. So I, I would recommend that website too. Make a film. Well, that's unfortunately all the time we have left. But uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Thank uh, you all Lost very much. River is playing in theaters. It's on iTunes, VOD, etc. Once again, Ryan Gosling. Thank you.